So, <laughs> you, you ain't heard nothing yet. Um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the uh, final session, I believe, of this extraordinary conference. Um, I, I feel a little bit dubious, as a dub would say, standing here as a complete blow-in to this remarkable occasion. And my first duty is to thank my great sparring partner and friend and colleague, uh, Morris Brick, for having invited me to be here today, and indeed to Mary O'Connor for having received me so graciously. Um, I am just an attendant lord swelling a scene or two. Um, my great privilege this afternoon is to moderate this session on Ivra and Irish opera, which, as you can plainly see, is being delivered by Gavin Ring. I also have to say that to introduce Gavin Ring in anywhere in the vicinity of Car Saivin is a bit like, like being asked to introduce, um, I don't know, uh, Elvis Presley in Memphis, Tennessee. <clears throat> <laughs> or closer to his heart, Ludwig van Beethoven in Bonn, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the phrase, local boy does good, hardly does justice. Um, but as many of you will know, uh, Gavin Ring is not only a native of Carl Saivin, but one of the truly rising international stars of opera and the concert platform of the present day. He so far transcends his Kerry nationality, if I may put it that way, and indeed more generally his Irishness, that he has a, a very, very strong presence in Europe, in Britain, and indeed further afield, <clears throat> particularly in opera. He's an astonishingly gifted baritone, a brilliant actor, and a great concert recitalist. And, you know, if I were to um, spend the afternoon reciting Gavin's achievements, um, there would only be about five minutes left for him to speak, so I... I have to foreshorten what is an extraordinarily illustrious career. Just recently, I mean, I'm surprised he's still, well, he's sitting now, but he'll be standing in a moment. Uh, given even the month he's had, as many of you will know, he gave a stunning uh, concert with Irish National Opera um, in the company of very distinguished soloists uh, on the 5th of August here in Karasaivin. Um, he made his proms debut in the most auspicious way imaginable um, under Sir Simon Rattle with the London Symphony Orchestra. Um, that concert was on the 18th of August in, in London and was broadcast actually last Sunday uh, on BBC Four. And he's done any number of things in between then. And he's taking the, the proms concert with uh, Sir Simon to the Lucerne Festival. He has uh, operatic engagements in Munich, his major operatic engagements uh, uh, in, with Opera uh, North following next year. And, and these are only a very small number of the, of the commitments that pay testament to his um, extraordinary range and, and reputation as an international soloist. Um, he is also, I have to say this, and this partly explains why I'm here indeed, very distinguished and very promising academic. Now, those, those two sides to one person is a very rare achievement indeed. But as it happens, I had the privilege and the pleasure of being the external examiner. It sounds rather ominous figure, but the person who had the privilege of reading Gavin's doctoral dissertation, which was on a subject, actually, that is not unrelated to the topic he's going to talk about today, which is the... Um, he was writing about the opera Ethna, which was uh, first given in 1910 by the Irish composer Robert Dwyer. In fact, uh, Robert Dwyer is a very interesting character in his own right. And as a result of um, Gavin's work, that opera had its first uh, performance in modern times. I think I'm right in saying the first in 117 years, in fact, last September in the, in the concert hall. It was a huge success. And I believe it's still available on YouTube if anybody wants to follow it up there. So that the, the work that he has done as an academic and his professional interest in the history and criticism of Irish opera is something that would like very close to my heart. And I'm delighted that he's chosen to talk about a related topic uh, here this afternoon. Um, there's, there's an ancillary reason which I would like to uh, offer as well. This is entirely personal. It sounds as if I'm uh, boasting a little bit. It's not meant to, but I, I need to tell the story in order to... To, uh, to justify this wonderful opportunity to, to moderate his talk. And that is that in May of uh, this year, at the very end of May, uh, much to my astonishment and surprise, a volume of essays was published to um, 
uh, celebrate the fact that I got as far as being 60 years old. And it was launched in the Royal Irish Academy and uh, in Dublin. And Gavin, who was in the middle of rehearsals for an extraordinarily taxing role uh, in the opera Capriccio by Richard Strauss, flew from London, learnt a setting of a poem that I had written, which was written by the Irish composer John Buckley, and sang it from memory on the occasion of that launch. Now, anybody who's familiar with contemporary music will know that that is an extraordinary achievement. So when the opportunity to come here and hear him speak uh, this afternoon arose, I was absolutely privileged to do so. Um, so it, it gives me genuine pleasure to ask you to welcome here to talk about Ivra and Irish opera, Dr. Gavin Ring. Thank you very much, Harry, for that extraordinary introduction. <laughs> I'm not quite sure um, that it's, it's pretty, I think it's downhill from that, if, <laughs> if I'm quite honest. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I suppose I, first I'll say I'm sorry for the delay. There was, as they'd say, at CIE, a technical difficulty. <laughs> And, um, but we're up and running now, thank God. Um, but uh, before I begin, I would like to uh, say how thrilled and delighted I am to be here in Derry Nan House this afternoon uh, to talk to you all. Uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, thank sincerely Professor Morris Brick and uh, Mary O'Connor uh, for inviting me uh, to present at the Daniel O'Connell Summer School this year. Um, as uh, Harry has told you, I am a, a local boy, a very proud uh, native of South Kerry, so it's a great honour for me, and I feel very humbled uh, to be included in what has been a truly illustrious uh, lineup of speakers and contributors this weekend. So I suppose 20, it's pertinent in a way that um, we're talking about opera at the Daniel O'Connell Summer School uh, this year, because 2018 has been an excellent year for opera in this country. Uh, we have um, officially inaugurated a new national company. It was inaugurated in January, Irish National Opera, which I'm very happy to say I'm an artistic partner with. And um, so I suppose, uh, in a way, uh, in the ether at the moment is uh, a recognition uh, that not only at government level have we to um, prioritise uh, policy when it comes to education and health and economic prudence and, and whatnot, uh, but that uh, the cultural and artistic life of the country is equally as, as important, so we've made a very good start in that regard. Um, so in this presentation, uh, I hope to offer some fresh perspectives on the overall cultural and historical context of Irish opera. Uh, the environment surrounding the creation and performances of the first Irish language opera, Murgish, by Cahersaivin born composer Thomas O'Brien Butler in 1903, coupled with added insight into the background of the composer and how the cradle of Ivara became the nucleus for somewhat of a trailblaze for subsequent Irish language operas throughout the era, in particular for Robert O'Dwyer's Ethna in 1909. Throughout this presentation, I will use incidences of live performance, uh, performance footage, and digitally reconstructed musical examples to illustrate a range of points. So it is estimated that some 280 operatic stage works with Irish thematic content were written in the period between 1780 and 1925. However, the works that make up this sizable body of repertoire, uh, both individually and collectively, have held and continue to hold a limited place in the Irish cultural context. In relation to opera, German musicologist Dr. Axel Klein has stated that there is scarcely any nation in the world whose music has been so little discovered, documented, or analyzed, to say nothing of performances or recordings, as the proverbial land of song. Klein further maintains that it is no longer possible to insist that a tradition of native Irish opera does not exist, and that an adequate reception of this tradition would be tantamount to re-examining the role of opera in the cultural history of Ireland. It has been suggested that the cultural history of Ireland is to a large degree independent of the trends and events that have formed the social and cultural destiny of the greater part of Western Europe. And while this statement is general, it does, however, reflect a reasonably fair summation of Irish cultural and social discourse within the European context, in particular with regard to the development and reception of Western art music. 
owing to a severely fractured cultural dynamic associated primarily with the strife-laden chronicle of Anglo-Irish relations, European art, culture and ethnic traditions have never quite shared equal status within the Irish cultural milieu. In significant contrast with the vast majority of other European countries, this anomaly is most evident in the context of music, and as a result, a sizable part of Ireland's musical heritage has been severely neglected. The New Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians describes this particular musical heritage as a form of art music incorporating the norms of European musical patronage assimilated as part of the colonial status quo. Ironically, it is this very perception of art music as an assimilation, an incompatible add-on perhaps, that has prevailed en masse in the Irish cultural imagination and reflects the all too prevalent attitude to art music and by default opera in Ireland as the mere uneasy expression of the colonial presence, to quote uh, Professor White, uh, who is chairing this session. Given this cultural conceptuality, it is quite remarkable that any semblance of indigenous art music repertoire came to exist at all. The first theatrical activities with a musical association in Ireland may well have taken place in the early 1600s, given court society's appetite for entertainment at Dublin Castle. However, the earliest recorded reference to opera in Ireland was in the year 1661 through a patent by King Charles II. In this patent, John Ogilvy, a central figure in the early musical and theatrical scene in Dublin, was to assume the position of master of the revels in Ireland and he should be licensed to build upon such grounds by him to be purchased in Dublin, such theatre or theatres as to him shall seem most fit and therein to represent comedies, tragedies and operas. The 1660 restoration of the monarchy in England saw a centralization of cultural activity in London, and with a rapidly expanding commercial base aided by a growing population, London developed a keen taste for varied social entertainment, and during the 18th century, a similar centralization occurred in Ireland's urban centers, particularly in Dublin. With the emergence of the Protestant ascendancy, Ireland's urban centres in particular uh, began to experience unprecedented economic expansion towards the end of the 17th century and throughout the 18th century. Enticed by a fluid trade market, many merchants invested in Ireland and the Irish economy grew steadily. This economic growth saw the population of Dublin rise from nearly 60,000 in 1700 to about 140,000 by 1760. Dublin became the second largest city to London in the British Isles and indeed within the British Empire itself. Dublin settled down to a period in which the affluence of the colonial governing class formed the ideal background for the cultivation of the arts. And opera in Ireland underwent its genesis and a considerable period of development during the 18th century uh, due to the political monopoly enjoyed by the new Protestant Anglo-Irish ascendancy. However, the ascendancy appeared not to espouse a significant taste for serious opera in Italian. English comic operas and ballad operas were far more popular than their Italian counterparts. Full-length opera accounted for approximately, full-length ballad opera, sorry, uh, accounted for approximately 30% of all theatre performed in Dublin during the 18th century. In fact, the first recorded instance of an operatic performance in Ireland was at Dublin Smock Alley Theatre in 1705, with the staging of Daniel Purcell's English ballad opera, The Island Princess. Fast forward to 1750 and the musical season in Dublin and the preeminence of ballad opera genre is most striking, revealing a total of 56 operatic performances of 17 different productions, including at least four performances of Johann Christoph Pepusch's hugely popular The Beggar's Opera. Aside from the linguistic barrier which may have impeded an audience's understanding of Italian opera, the popularity of English ballad opera undoubtedly reflected its contemporary uh, popularity in London. The influence of ballad opera on the development of Irish operatic works was to be significant. R.V. Comerford notes that, with regard to the ballad opera model, ethnic melodies such as Eileen Aroon had a place alongside works of internationally celebrated composers at Dublin's fashionable concerts from at least the 1740s. Therefore, the busy tradition of ballad opera is crucial, as arguably it paved the way for the eventual, albeit laboured, synthesis of Irish ethnic and European art music in opera. Dr. Axel Klein again suggests that Tommaso Giordani's ballad opera, The Pantomime, our ballad opera Pantomime, The Island of Saints, or The Institution of the Shamrock, is the first real instance of an operatic or musical stage work uh, containing Irish ethnic influences. The music in all surviving prints contains the overture and an extensive medley based on Irish traditional melodies such as the Rakes of Westmead, the Miners of Wicklow, and the Lurkrum Crush. 
the comic or ballad opera works of John O'Keefe and William Shield, such as The Poor Soldier from 1783, were further examples of the early development uh, of Irish opera, with many Irish traditional songs and dances being employed. The suppression of the Catholics in Ireland with the penal laws during the 18th century meant that there was no guarantee of social and political constancy. And at the end of the 18th century, Ireland once again erupted into militarized rebellion against this status quo. To compound matters, the unrest also gave way to a spectacular economic crash. Following the disbandment of the Irish Parliament, the, uh, the country's economy tumbled into recession and many of the leading gentry relocated to London. The wealthier classes, who so willingly patronised and cultivate, helped to cultivate the art throughout the 18th century, were now living primarily outside of Ireland, and the consequential waning in expenditure gave rise to serious financial problems throughout the country. For example, an acre of Dublin land before the cessation of the Irish Parliament cost more than three times its equivalent in London. However, by 1820, the value of Dublin land had halved, and Merrion Square mansions, which were sold at nearly £8,000 each in the 1790s, plummeted to £2,500 by 1801. And by the time of the Irish famine in the late 1840s, the same properties were available for less than £5 each. So... The operatic activity and the continued synthesis of art music and ethnic Irish music that was slowly but surely becoming a feature in local composition during the 18th century stagnated. Correspondingly, the early 19th century saw the dawn of the Romantic Age in music. More and more contemporary art music was being underpinned by the melodies of the rich and varied ethnic traditions of continental Europe. Notwithstanding the ever-increasing social and economic decay in Ireland, there are some noteworthy, yet isolated, examples of Irish operatic works that align with the contemporary European compositional zeitgeist. Operas such as Johann Bernard Logier, uh, Brian Boroeve, which is a modification on the name Brian Boru, um, and Thomas Simpson's Cooks, the Prince of the Lakes, are examples of works which sought to merge the indigenous repertoire with European art music. Logier's Brian Boroeva, the plot concerns the Battle of Clontarf, uh, in particular is a fascinating, ma fascinating manifestation of the genre. Logier, of Huguenot extraction, was born in Kassel, Germany, came to Ireland around 1789 and settled in Dublin in 1809. The overture and several arias in Brian Boroeva are interspersed with traditional music influences include, uh, which include a number of direct ethnic quotations such as the air The Bard's Legacy, an air used by Thomas Moore. Uh, for the se his setting of When in Death I Shall Calm Recline. Musicologist Ita Hogan singles out Brian Boroeva in particular as being significant of the growth of Irish nationalism and a genuine attempt to present a stirring episode in Irish history. Although throughout the 19th century, Ireland appeared not to overly, uh, overtly use opera for the dissemination of nationalistic expression, Hogan's assessment appears to carry some weight and one wonders why more operas like this didn't surface. After all, the work's nationalistic cred credentials would be, appear to be strengthened by its chronological proximity to the 1798 rebellion, the 1801 Act of Union, and the 1803 Young Irelanders Uprising. Indeed, it was directly ascribed the term of patriotism in the Dublin Satirist in a contemporary review in 1810. Furthermore, and more interestingly, Brian Barova was actually performed regularly in Ireland up until 1834. Unfortunately, any development of Irish indigenous opera fell victim, not only to continued cultural neglect, but also to the hugely significant impact of a badly failing economy. Furthermore, those who thought nationalistically throughout most of the 19th century were not overly concerned with art, music, or opera as a medium for the expression of this nationalism. In fact, the collective construction of conventional Irish nationalism during the 19th century uh, appeared to involve a fairly blatant exclusion of art, music, and opera, with the possible exception of the publication of Moore's Melodies, although the ramifications of which arguably proved more detrimental than helpful to the relationship between classical music and the construction of Irish nationalism. Correspondingly, two of Ireland's greatest operatic exponents of the mid-19th century, Michael William Balfe and Vincent Wallace, seemed just as congruently uninterested in any significant expression of contemporary Irish nationalism. Balfe's The Bohemian Girl uh, and Wallace's Maritana regularly, yet rather ingenuously, uh, dubbed pa part of the Irish ring, along with Julius Benedict's later work, The Lily of Killarney, can in no way be described as Irish works or even remotely related to the contemporary Irish cultural context. Comerford admits that although these works are sometimes referred to as the Irish Ring, unlike Wagner's operas, let's say, they do not have a distinctive national accent. 
both Balfe's and Wallace's foremost position as composers abroad, um, particularly in England, may well have inhibited them from making any significant Irish nationalistic statements in their work, as this would surely have affected their livelihoods in a negative fashion. However, while there is little or no evidence to suggest that Wallace and Balfe were overly interested in the expression of a burgeoning realisation of contemporary Irish nationalism in their operas, it would be remiss not to mention Balfe's noteworthy arrangement of Moore's Irish melodies in 1859. The nationalistic subject matter of Moore's poetry, as one contemporary describes, might have afforded fair scope for prosecution to a hostile attorney general. Although while it is clear that Balfe wanted to atone for the musical misgivings of Sir John Stevenson's original arrangement of Moore's melodies, which are pretty awful, um, the very fact that Balfe decided to take on such a project may suggest that he had more interest in some expression of contemporary Irish nationalism than he is given credit for. During the 18th and 19th centuries, a significant proportion of the resident urban communities in Ireland, particularly in Dublin, were loyal to the union of Britain and Ireland yet definitively did not consider themselves English, not unlike certain factions of the unionist community in Northern Ireland today. This sort of paradox in national identity then developed and manifested itself in various cultural expressions throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. One of the most noteworthy expressions of this conceptuality came in the form of Charles Villiers Stanford's 1895 opera, Seamus O'Brien. The opera is, ironically, the best known Irish opera of the 19th century. And interestingly, its compositional makeup represents the first significant emphasis on a, on a combination of different strands of Irish subject matter. Thus, according to Nicholas Temperley, when national flavor in opera becomes instantly recognizable, both musically and thematically, an opera such as Seamus O'Brien is arguably the first recognizable example of an Irish national opera, albeit coming from a different cultural point of view. Seamus O'Brien, and indeed his popularity, perhaps reflects a significant part of contemporary Irish society that up until recently has tended to be overlooked, and that would be West Britainism. The plot of Seamus O'Brien is a parody of the 1798 rebellion, which in itself is quite a bold choice and perhaps a pointed one by Stanford, especially given the proximity of the centenary commemorations in 1898 and the rise to prominence of contemporary Irish nationalistic and artistic movements, uh, in particular the Gaelic and Irish literary revivals. The advent of significant cultural revivals in Ireland towards the end of the 19th century saw the emergence of organizations such as the Gaelic Athletic Association, the Gaelic League, the foundation of the Abbey Theatre, and the preeminence of some of Ireland's most renowned international writers and literary artists. However, there was a significant influx of operatic material composed during this broad cultural revival also. General revival philosophies tended to rail against the shameless shamrockery in contemporary representations of Ireland in literature and theatre, St Stanford Seamus O'Brien probably fitted this bill. And according to Thomas Bartlett, self-consciously sought to realize a new national art, one that would be unmistakably Irish, yet cosmopolitan rather than insular and displaying genuine literary merit. This more cosmopolitan artistic outlook on Irish nationalistic expression led to collaboration between prominent figures such as Douglas Hyde and Michele Esposito. Three works in particular, however, stand out from the operas composed during this period of cultural revival. Thomas O'Brien Butler's Murugish in 1903, Robert O'Dwyer's Etna in 1909, and Geoffrey Molyneux Palmer's Shra Namila in 1923. And they are all unique in that they are the only known operas in this period composed in the Irish language. Each plot is also taken from some ancient Irish legend, and although the story of Murgish was fabricated by the composer and the librettists, it is nonetheless thematically charged by Celtic mythology. With regard to Fan de Siecle, Irish cultural revivals, of which the resurrection of the Irish language was an integral part, these works can be described as quintessential products. Todd Felton identifies the rejuvenation of a long dormant Irish cultural tradition while simultaneously developing a new and distinct national identity for Ireland as central to revival-based works. Thomas O'Brien Butler's Murugish was the first work to set such a precedent for opera in Ireland. The work is exemplary with regard to archetypal revival-centered ideals and in particular provided the much-needed performance benchmark for the likes of O'Dwyer to exploit with his opera Ethna six years later. Thomas O'Brien Butler was born in Cahars Iveen, County Kerry, on the 3rd of November 1861. The youngest of a large family with a registered address of Key Street in Cahars Iveen, he was born to Pierce Butler, a draper and butter merchant in the town, and his wife Ellen 
who was Nee Webb. Thomas was educated at St. Coleman's College in Fermoy and held a number of Catholic church organist positions later, including briefly at Yall, County Cork, and Burr, County Offaly. Adopting the name Whitwell Butler, a common Christian name among his ancestors in Waterville, in the 1890s, he emigrated to New Zealand. Here he worked for some years as music teacher and choir master. Leaving New Zealand in 1895, Butler then studied music privately in Milan with Alberto Giovannini before enrolling for three terms at the Royal College of Music in London from 1897 to 1898, where he studied with Charles Villiers Stanford. Axel Klein notes here that Butler had not been a very successful student at the Royal College of Music. He did well in harmony, but much less so in composition. However, Stanford's political ideology, which was unmistakably unionist, clearly did not have any influence over Butler during his time at the Royal College of Music as it is likely that his spell in London brought him into contact with the fledgling Irish cultural revivals. Butler's immediate family was also Catholic and perhaps naturally sympathetic with contemporary nationalist movements. His eldest brother, also called Pierce, was killed in the Fenian Rising of 1867. Thus, for Butler, cultural revival and the reinvention of Irish national, nationalistic expression may have seen an attractive movement with which to associate himself as a composer. It is often reputed that O'Brien Butler composed Murgish while visiting Kashmir in northern India, but the Kerry Sentinel on the 16th of August 1899 notes that while holidaying in Kerry, he was at present working at an Irish opera. O'Brien Butler visited India before his studies in Milan, well before he turned his thoughts to composing Murgish. The composition of Murgish took about three years to complete, and it was premiered on the 7th of December 1903 at the Theatre Royal in Dublin. Set in Waterville, County Kerry, the ancestral home of Butler's family, at the dawn of Christianity, the plot of the work concerns, concerns a love triangle between the heroine of the opera, Murgish, her foster sister, Moira, and a neighbouring chieftain, Dermot. Before Murgish, Butler composed a number of smaller works, most of which were songs. Uh, and an example of his reasonable prominence as a composer is highlighted by the inclusion of his piece, Kinkura, which was set at the Dublin Feshkjol for the Irish soprano category in 1915. The production of Murgish was instigated chiefly by Conran the Gaelge, or the Gaelic League, but Butler endeavoured to interest as many of the prime movers of the cultural revivals as he possibly could. In fact, such was the support for his project that Podrick Pierce, Edward Martin and Owen McNeill were all members of the committee which was convened to promote and have the opera performed. William Butler Yeats also connected him with Nora Hopper to fashion the libretto. However, he didn't impress everyone in these elite circles. And some of the entries from the, from the diaries of Lady Gregory make for interesting, if somewhat unflattering, reading. Upon visiting W.B. Yeats on the 4th of May, 1900, she writes, he, Yeats, says there is a new recruit to the Celtic movement, a musician, O'Brien Butler, who is writing an opera and wants a libretto and wants a cottage in County Galway, <laughs> where he can work. Um, George Moore had spent two hours listening to him and said he was better than Stanford and was delighted. Yeats had sent him to see Nora Hopper to ask her to do a libretto. Now, the following day. Then to tea with Yeats to meet O'Brien Butler, didn't think him very intelligent or attractive, but asked, asked him for a few days when he comes over that he may look for a cottage. And finally, on the 7th of May, 1900, loaded my luggage at the station and dined with Yeats and Gerald, uh, and Gerald Moore, or George Moore, the latter says it was only O'Brien Butler's general amiability since his conversion to Ireland that made him compliment him or sit two hours with him during which he was bored to death. <laughs> However, Miss Hopper arrived after dinner and they pounded out the libretto. Edward Martin described Murgish as being saturated with folk music. With regard to the musical style of Murgish, musicologist Joseph Ryan also makes the point that while the work is certainly noteworthy, it is, however, not without its limitations. After a respectable overture and strong first act, the following two acts move more in the manner of a ballad opera with choruses aplenty and fairies and wedding guests with a succession of traditional dances. The composer employs a stringent economy and consciously cultivates an Irish style that notwithstanding the technical limitations and unevenness result in a work of some merit. Let's have a little listen now to a digitally reconstructed extract from the overture. You will hear that the contours of nearly every melody and melodic motif are strongly based on folk music.
So, <clears throat> Butler is so explicit in his use of Irish folk music uh, in Murugish as to add an unaccompanied quina, a traditional Irish song of mourning sung in the opera by a banshee to, to signify the death of Moira. This quina is sung twice. Now, although I am not, alas, a banshee, uh, if you will indulge me, I will nonetheless exemplify this quina for you now. <clears throat> So there is an interesting footnote uh, regarding the inspiration for this quina added by O'Brien Butler in the vocal score. He states, on the death of my parents and other members of my family, my nurse, Mrs. Nora Fitzpatrick, who lived with us for over 40 years, wailed this traditional ancient quina in her anguish at the effect of which I can never forget, her wringing of hands and sobs to heighten her grief. Just before Christmas 1914, Butler traveled to America, attempting to raise interest among American impresarios for some performances of Murgish. During his stay, he arranged a concert of some of his music at the Aeolian Hall on the 19th of April, 1914. Having concluded his business, he boarded the RMS Lusitania to return to Ireland on the 1st of May, 1915. And as is well known, the ship was torpedoed by a German submarine off the old head of Kinsale six days later and Butler was one of almost 1,200 passengers and crew who died as a, result, as a result. His body was never recovered, and it is presumed that Butler's original orchestral score for Murugish was lost with the sinking of the Lusitania. Therefore, it is difficult to, deter to determine with any degree of certainty the expanse and texture of the orchestral arrangement. It is worth noting, noting that Ryan, Joseph Ryan, makes a further important point regarding the fact that Murugish is occasionally referred to as the first native Irish opera, an eminence dependent wholly on the use of an Irish text. Although it appears uh, that it was Butler's initial intention that Murugish be performed in the Irish language for the premiere in 1903, he had trouble securing singers who could deliver the project efficiently in Irish, so the first performance was indeed sung in English. It is Robert O'Dwyer's Ethna that is regarded as the first opera to be publicly performed in Irish. One could argue that what Butler started in 1903, Robert O'Dwyer continued with his seminal Irish language opera Ethna in 1909, as it is largely agreed that Ethna represents the first real instance of success in the synthesis of Irish traditional music and European art music. Ethna was also the first opera to employ its Irish language text and performance. However, the dislocation of art music within the Irish cultural context, and in particular within the parameters of the Irish cultural and uh, Irish cultural revival, meant that works as significant and substantial as Murugish or Ethna, and indeed a great deal more Irish art music works, 
could not provide the stimulus for the establishment of a new national concept of, of art music. The production of works such as Murugish or Etna was, however, seen by many as the ideal vehicle of opportunity to establish the concept of a purely national opera for Ireland. The writer in the Belfast Telegraph, pre previewing and promoting Etna in July 1909, made an impassioned case for this very idea. It is impossible, he writes, to think of an Ireland in which there should be no opera. It would be sad to think that only one opera known in Ireland should be foreign. It would be sad to think that the lovely, rich sound of Irish should never flow out in sonorous chorus, that the delicate, infinitely tuneful and searching melodies of the old times should never be heard rising in their sweetness over the sumptuous magnificence of orchestral harmonies. We must have a national opera, as we must someday have a national school of painting and architecture and sculpture. Without it, our national life would be thin and our rising country would look strangely maimed. However, the same writer later points to the fact that opera is not seen as an important part of Irish culture, stating that the Gael has not the habit of opera. <laughs> this statement resonates in its simplicity and perhaps still holds true to this day. Despite pleas for both Murugish and Ethna to be restaged and performed again in the immediate years following the 1909, or sorry, in the 1903 and 1909 performances, the political events which unfolded between the 1916 Rising and the establishment of the Irish Free State in 1922 significantly curtailed any appetite for the dissemination of Irish operatic state works. Furthermore, in the years immediately following the establishment of the Free State, the old colonial power, as it were, was simply replaced by a new bourgeoisie and bureaucratic elite. And in the ensuing atmosphere of cultural claustrophobia, art music unfortunately received little attention or subsidy. Any strong association with the Irish language movement may well have also inhibited any initial holistic social acceptance, acceptance of these works in terms of the less open-minded Anglo or Protestant viewpoint given the significant religious and cultural tensions of the time, correspondingly and paradoxically, as the political context of Ireland became more militarised, the use of the Irish language in an art form associated with the colonial influence may well have inhibited its acceptance in the imagination of the Catholic or nationalist viewpoint. In short, the socio-political issues related to the Irish language movement may well have been a significant contributing factor to these works' reception malaise. The concept of Irish national identity does, however, present an issue beyond simplistic ethnic Irish versus art music English distinctions, particularly in terms of late 19th century, early 20th century Ireland, and charting some sort of cultural common ground between works as thematically disparate as Murugish and Seamus O'Brien, for example. Klein acknowledges this difficulty in defining the Irishness of an opera such as Seamus O'Brien, or even Arthur Sullivan's The Emerald Isle in 1901, which is another 1798 rebellion parody, but littered with ethnic Irish musical connotation. In dealing with this issue, Klein advises that the kind of West British patriotism represented by Stanford in particular must certainly be seen within the context of its time. To agree with Klein and to further advance this viewpoint by considering Richard Toruskin's concept of that, 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 sorry, that definitions of nationalism, of course, depend on definitions of nation. It is therefore crucial to imply that the nation or the national, as Benedict Anderson describes, is a construct and not a given. This implication is vital in grappling with the diversity of viewpoint and expression throughout the development of native Irish opera from 1780 to 1925. Benjamin Dwyer, with particular reference to, mid, to 19th century musical endeavour in Ireland, explicates that in fin de siècle Ireland, the question of identity was complex and often simultaneously contradictory. In dealing with this complexity, historian Richard Kearney espouses a, conceptual, a conceptuality based on the multiplicity of Irish minds, therefore connoting nationalism in Ireland as a multidimensional concept and indicative of multiple realities, this is an important notion if a native operatic tradition is to be in some way recognised. For example, rather than solely describing Sullivan's The Emerald Isle as Seamus Shamrockery, or indeed Stanford's Seamus O'Brien, as completely disconnected from and unaware of national movements in Ireland, such as the literary revival, which it was, the alternative expression, perhaps, of this Irishness, of which these operas are representative, may perhaps be acknowledged. It is also extensively argued that, rather than assisting a cosmopolitan art music expression of Irish identity, 
Movements such as the Irish Literary Revival further accentuated the divergence between ethnic and art music traditions by the use of formal musical constructs as vital tools in the creation of contemporary Irish literature. However, this suggests that Western art music was certainly not an alien medium in the minds of the exponents of these legacies, and while it may not be definitively claimed that contemporary native manifestations of opera such as Murgish were fundamentally influential on Irish nationalistic thought, the current primacy of the literary, Irish literary revival as the most championed facade for the early 20th century reinvention of Irish national consciousness does little to advance a comprehensive consideration of an Irish operatic heritage. For works as musically advanced as Murugish or Etna, any over-reliance on the idea of music of Western art origin or otherwise as a mere secondary influence on the formation of contemporary literary and theatrical output by default undermines an independent consideration of these works on their own artistic merits. It discounts, as, de as described by Benjamin Dwyer, the not insubstantial activity of compositional cross-fertilization that did occur. Works such as Murugish and Ethna, both musically and culturally, are some of the crowning achievements of that very cross-fertilization. To conclude this presentation, let's have a look at some of last October's footage of the first performance of Ethna since 1910. This was filmed live at the National Concert Hall in Dublin with the RTE National Symphony Orchestra, Opera Theatre Company Chorus, soloists, including yours truly, and conducted by Fergus Scheel. This is the final rip-roaring moments of the finale of Act One, where the High King of Ireland declares a hunt, singing, O for o for o, is gal ve bio, gotatna ve cor, gan brown in Erden. Hurrah, hurrah, it's wonderful to be alive with such happiness in Ireland. Thank you very much. This isn't the Albert Hall, but I really think that Gavin has brought another great triumph to the Chronicles of Music and indeed to his own career here today. That is a fantastic uh, tour de force and a wonderful um, and passionate uh, survey, really, and case for 
why we don't have opera and why we should have opera. And, and the, 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 the closing there from, um, from Dwyer's uh, Ethna brings it to a brilliant conclusion. Um, I understand that it's possible for questions to be raised now. I don't know whether we should start in the AV room or the sort of, this is the kind of Houston we have a problem moment. <laughs> I've never been to a conference where this happens before, but I heard it going on today. So should we start with the AV room? Is there anybody in the... Oh, there's actually people here in the chapel. Should, should we? I'm at a loss. We'll take, the, we'll take these in the chapel first then. Sorry about that, AV room. We'll be back to you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Charles Villiers Standard Ford used a holiday down here. Oh, yes, yes. I as as the, um, he was the best friend of Alfred Percival Graves, you know, the Graves of uh, Park Nasilla, you know. Yeah. I forget what else I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Just on the, on, the, on the subject of Stanford, I, 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 Gavin knows this, but uh, since you mentioned Seamus O'Brien, and, it's, uh, and Stanford's own unionist complexions. Stanford withdrew Seamus O'Brien from public performance in 1910 because he was afraid it would encourage home rule. So that's a quite interesting thing. The, the political message of the opera got the better of him. Sorry, does anybody? Yes. Can you? Um, I think somehow the microphone is. Can you hear me? Gavin, you're going to be in the hot seat, haven't you? <laughs> James, hire the volume up, please. A question from the AV room. Hello, Gavin. Can you hear me? Uh, we're now in two rooms at once, I'm afraid. We'll take the AV room first there, yeah. sir. Okay. This isn't a question. This is just a suggestion. Yep. I had the great privilege to attend the performance uh, in the concert hall uh, last autumn. Oh, yes. Absolutely superb. Thank and you. I would just make the suggestion that perhaps it would be possible uh, within the next two years for Cahersavine or someplace here in Ivro to uh, hold it not just as a conference, as a concert performance, but as a full operatic performance. I am from County Wexford and uh, I am very conscious of the fact that the Wexford Festival was uh, started by Dr. Tom Walsh. And I think when you have such wonderful talent here in Ivra, it's certainly an opportunity to uh, consider uh, a music festival here in Ivra. And what better way to do it than with an operatic full performance of Ethna? Mm. Well, yeah. That's a, it's a, it's a very interesting point that you make, actually. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that in, in County Kerry, we possess uh, a remarkable arts officer in Kate Kennelly. And uh, I've been um, uh, collaborating with her and um, uh, in various discussions with her over the last number of years uh, to achieve uh, exactly what you're talking about. Um, you mentioned Dr. Tom Walsh. That's a very high bar to be setting. <laughs> Um, but absolutely, I think that uh, I think that um, certainly Kate. I know I know from my from my from my discussions with her, very much values the art form of opera and very much values uh, what it can achieve not only uh, as a cultural stimulus but crucially as an educational stimulus and a vehicle for for for, for real quality um, uh, education not only uh, in, in in music but in in so many uh, interdisciplinary areas in particular history and art and 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 everything so um, there rest assured there are fairly solid plans afoot to achieve just what you've suggested <laughs> We've got one more question from the AV room. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, you probably heard this question a few oh, times before. Sorry. <laughs> yes, fire away, AV room. Okay. Sorry. Uh, we'll get you then. Uh, Gavin, you've probably been asked this question a few times before, but any chance of one last song before you go? <laughs> and uh, I, I was thinking of what might be a suitable song. Um, I know you sing the Kerry dances. But in where we are and considering what we're celebrating, maybe Danny Boy might be a better one. Yeah. Is, that, is that Christy Connell? No, Jerry Enright. Oh. <laughs> um, 
Absolutely. I'll, 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 give you, I'll give you one blast at the end of the, when, whenever we've, we've got all, all the questions answered and, and everyone's happy, we'll, 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 we'll do something. All right, Jerry, you might join along yourselves. Sorry, this gentleman yeah, has a question yeah, here. A minor question, really. Please. Gavin. Uh, I'm wondering about the word Murkish. Yeah. Where Butler got it, and, or, you know, what? Well, it literally translates as the sea swan. Um, uh, so, yeah, sorry, I, probably, I should have made that clear at the beginning. <laughs> but that should yeah. be Gish, Gish, Murkish. Yeah, that's right. So, so yeah. I, I, I mean, uh, an awful lot of the Irish, particularly in those operas, um, Murkish and Etna, and... Um, uh, the Sean uh, uh employed, uh, um, I suppose, antiquated, I suppose, words that are not overly in use today. Um, so uh, I, I presume he was well. He was he was reasonably well versed. His his librettist actually for the Irish libretto was a guy called Taigo Dunahu, um, who had the yeah. Uh, so I mean he was he was fairly well up in revival and Gaelic league circles and. Uh, he uh, he fashioned a fantastic libretto. Actually, I would I would I would go as far as to say that the libretto in Murugish is probably the strongest of the three. Um, it's inc incredibly well fashioned, and, and, and the language in it is really beautiful. Yeah. Very good, Gavin. Not at all. Lander the Lord. Got a meal, my husband. Keep it up. <laughs> is there anybody else in any? Oh yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah Dravi. Okay. Just one second, Dravi. I apologise. Um, a comment, um, a peculiar one. God bless your diaphragm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It pays the bills. <laughs> one more question from the AV room. Uh, okay, and can I just say that if anybody following that in the marquee wants to ask a question, you're very welcome to do that. Okay, so, but from the AV room once more. Go ahead. Gavin, thank you for a ma magnificent uh, tour de force there. I was struck by the slightly Wagnerian overtones in the piece that you played from the opera and was wondering to what extent did Wagner exercise an influence over these composers? Well, I think, um, I think both from a musical point of view, obviously, I mean, Wagner was, uh, I, I, I suppose, you were one of the great high points in a 19th century composition. So any composer worth their salt, uh, regardless of, um, of their hue, would have attended to some degree uh, to what um, Wagner was about from a compositional point of view. But I think crucially for me, um, uh, Wagner's influence uh, very much came from his, uh, from his critical writings and the idea of, um, uh, you know, das Werk and the idea of the work being for the, the, uh, being for the people and being, I suppose, the, uh, the world in which an opera should inhabit uh, being sort of um, an idealistic one or one certainly inhabited by myth, myth, by mythological um, elements and ones and, and that those mythological myth, mythological elements are deeply rooted in the history or the the, the mythology of the particular uh, the particular people in question um, and I suppose that informed not only not just the creation of these operas but certainly it, it informed all strains of romantic nationalism, which sort of swept across Europe towards the end of the 19th century. Um, so I think, I think, I think, I think. Uh, but obviously, we're dealing with opera here. I think Wagner had had a major sort of philosophical influence um, in the construction of the sort of thematic world in which these operas inhabit, and what their purpose was in terms of um, what political statement they were making, and uh, how they were copper fastening a certain um, nationalistic consciousness. Um, uh, and uh, but 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 obviously from a musical perspective as well. I mean those the, the, those 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 you when 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 you're I suppose as well. It's important to remember that these works, in a way, the likes of Murgish, Etna, and Shonamila, but certainly Mur Murgish and Etna, um, and again very much and in particular Etna, uh, were I suppose in their time. You're talking, you know, 1903, 1909. They were I suppose would have been seen as a little bit old-fashioned, actually. Um, from a musical point of view, because if you think about it at the time, you know, you had luminaries such as Puccini and Debussy and all these sort of characters um, really sort of um, 
uh, challenging the, the very much breaking the boundaries of, 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 of what was, uh, came before in, in terms of Verdi and Wagner. Um, uh, so uh, it, it probably harks back uh, a little more to, um, to, to, to what Verdi and Wagner were, were, were trying to achieve. Uh, but there's so many influences in the mix in those operas. Um, I, I suppose, in a way, I know I'm rambling on here now a small bit, but this always happens. Um, uh, it, there was very much a movement at the time to establish this idea of an Irish art music school of composition. And it never really found its way, if that makes any sense. There were so many sort of experiments and first attempts and, and, and trying to sort of find out what, you know, uh, wh where was the Irish Dvorak, for example. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think we ever quite reached that stage, but what we had were excellent frissances of the attempts to get, to, to, to get there. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, I, I think we at most have time for maybe, uh, yeah, we're really fresh out of time. I'm so sorry about that. I, I'm getting conflicting uh, instructions here, Ruth, so I'm, I think we have to stop. Oh, oh okay. Well, is, is there any, I just, one, I think one question from the marquee, if that's, the marquee is detached and replete. As we, should, as we should all be after that wonderful presentation. So I'm not sure if he's going to sing or not, but let's, let's at least encourage him by renewing our profound thanks to Gavin for a wonderful speech. So I suppose...
Well, how can I follow that? Um, I had the great privilege and pleasure of being in the O'Connell Memorial Church in August and with the, the National Opera, and uh, it was incredible and beautiful and such a, a wonderful experience for everybody. And Gavin has done incredible work to help in the restoration of that beautiful church. And I really want to applaud him for all the work he's done. I would also like to say, Gavin, I hope you know when you travel all over the world how deeply proud the people of Ivara are of you. Um, first of all, just to say a huge thank you to all the speakers and moderators over the last few days. You have given everybody that has attended the school they have been absolutely praising you from all through the day, and we thank you so very much for being with us. Um, I would also like to thank Olivia O'Leary and her film crew, Magna Media. It has been just wonderful to see you in our midst over the last two days, and we all look forward to the documentary you're doing on Dan O'Connell. It's something we've wanted for so long, so you'll all be on that film, so look forward to it. <laughs> Um, yesterday at lunch, um, I was in the company, the great company, of our wonderful former minister, John O'Donoghue. John has been a great supporter of our school always, and indeed did so much as Minister for Arts and Tourism and Heritage for our county and our country. Um, John said to me during lunch, he said, my goodness, Mary, the programme, you're in your sixth year, and the programme is so wonderful. The wonderful lineup. How do you do it? And I said simply one word: Mirish. <laughs> it has been. He, he gives so much of himself to our community, to the whole of Ivara. His time is endless. It doesn't stop. I can guarantee you tomorrow there'll be a phone call and a message and a plan for 2019. So thank you, Mirish, on behalf of everybody here for all that you do so quietly and your generosity to our community is greatly appreciated. Um, I would also like to very much say a huge thank you to the O'Connell family. In 1963, they gifted this house and its gardens to the state. And what a gift. Like, without it, O'Connell wouldn't be remembered as he is, but the joy that people have got through this house, through the gardens, and I really want to applaud the family today for gifting it and being so generous to us as a community and, as, and to the country. And they handed it over to the OPW. And to the OPW, to Chris O'Neill, to Adrian Corcoran, to the people who tell the story every day of O'Connell, and Marie, Charlotte, Declan, Mary B, and Brenda, I say thank you. You tell the story daily of this great man, and we really appreciate the work you do. To the people in the garden, to James O'Shea, Michael, and John Morn, Chris and Pat, such a wonderful gardens to have in our, in our country. And we're delighted this year that you got so much coverage. Um, it's richly deserved, and we thank you and congratulate you for the work you do daily. We need sponsors, of course, for our school, so this can happen. And I, we have some wonderful sponsors. Dermot and Siobhan Walsh with Supervalue and Carsevine. They give generously to us every year. Glasnevin Trust. George McCullough has been a huge support. Brian McCarthy and FESCO. And we're deeply grateful for that sponsorship. Um, Kerry County Council have been a huge support this year, especially through Kate Kennelly. 
Gavin is right. She's, Kate does incredible work for the county. And True Tree Creative Ireland, which is a new initiative this year um, with Arts Heritage and the Gaeltacht, they have given us funding, which has allowed us to do much more. We're hoping next year to stream the school, but this year in a week's time, please God, and don't quote me, it might be two weeks, you know, you'll be able to go and watch this wonderful performance. Um, over the last two days, you'll be able to listen to all the speakers online. So we're really grateful to them for their help and their support. Um, I would like to especially thank um, the press, especially Barry Roach and Breda Joy. They, Barry comes here every single year and spends two days here. Without him, our message and the message of the school wouldn't get out. And we're very, very grateful. And of course, to Kerry Radio and all the other people who, who help us and promote the school. Um, I would also like to thank very much our audiovisual team. I think they're superb. John and James get very tired of listening to me, but they are really wonderful. They give and dedicate their time over the few days, and I'd really like to say a huge thank you to them. Locally, I'd like to thank James White, who does the signs every year without being asked, Michael O'Connor, Co Krista with Johnny O'Sullivan and the, and the bus, um, Anne Boland, Noreen Kern and Olivia tomorrow morning in the hall, Father Martin, who's such a loyal supporter, um, Deirdre and her team in the tea rooms, what a wonderful food we've had, I've certainly enjoyed it, Derry Nan in Shore Rescue help us out each year, and we're so grateful to you all. Carsevine Library yesterday, what can I say? Noreen, Brendan, Michelle, and Anne, you know, they're there. It's a team, and they work with us, and they'll do anything at all we ask them. A huge thank you to them, and to Kieran and all his team. Yesterday, we were very quietly and quickly looked after by a wonderful group of ladies in the tea room there who gave us our coffee. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to, to Betty, Rosari, Maureen, Francis, and Mary. Thank you very much for looking after us. Um, Deirdre and her team and the tea rooms again, as I said, the food was lovely. That leaves the most wonderful committee you could ever work with. And I mean that, they all do their work. We don't have that many meetings, surprisingly, because everyone, sorry, excuse me, everyone just gets on with what they have to do. We all get on well together, we have our debates and our laughs, but we work really hard together, but really well together. Junior Murphy, I have to say a special thank you to her. He is the most wonderful man. I had the privilege, as many of us here, we spoke earlier, he was my history teacher, geography, sorry, geography and history teacher at school. And I hope he knows how much he's loved by all his past pupils and by everyone on the committee, how much we admire him and treasure him. So Junior, a very sincere and heartfelt thank you. Um, to Ruth, to Phil, to Christy, to Jerry, thank you. You work tireless with me. Marie, my colleague and friend, Marie White, here in the parish, um, you all work very silently and quietly to make this happen. So thank you. Also, Jerry O'Connor, our solicitor, for the last six years, has never, ever sent me a bill. <laughs> so thank you, Jerry. <laughs> so, to you who attend each year, who generously donate, the friends of the school and those who contribute each year, without you, there would be no school. So I applaud you all and thank you for being with us. I wish you a safe trip home and I hope you've enjoyed it and please God, we look forward to what Mirish will bring us for 2019. <laughs> God bless you.